Hi, everybody, and welcome to you all to today's seminar hosted by the International Inequalities Institute at the LSE. I'm Kirsten Sainbrock. I am a British Academy Global Professor here at the uh, Institute and a Distinguished Policy Fellow, and currently also the Acting Director. I'm incredibly pleased today to be chairing today's seminar entitled Inequality Measurement for Bounded Variables, which sounds terribly technical. Shuman has assured me he's going to make it comprehensible to us all. <laughs> As part of our III inequality series, and today's speaker is Dr. Shuman Seth. Shuman is an associate professor in economics at Leeds University Business School and also a research associate at OFI, probably familiar to most of you, which is the Oxford Poverty and Human Development Initiative at the University of Oxford. And he's also the incoming editor of the Review of Income and Wealth, which may be of interest. I just found out this morning. That's all congratulations on that new role as well. Um, may I ask our online audience to keep yourselves muted um, for the presentation? And of course, at the end, there will be a chance for everybody to ask questions in the online chat. And I'm now going to hand over to Schumann. Just before I do, though, I just wanted to let you know that the copy is slightly delayed. So <laughs> please feel free. <laughs> when it comes, please feel free to get up and help yourself and also have a copy afterwards if you want. Um, but Schumann, over to you. Thank you. Can you hear me? No? And there you go, the other side. Thank you so much, Russell, for the generous interview. And you know that the coffee is late, so it's falls on me to give you a little bit. Okay. Uh, so thank you so much, and it is so good to be um, here um, among uh, you all. So, as First and said, uh, it is supposed to be a technical presentation. But I'm just trying to scale well. No, it is not. So there will be some slides, and I will try to keep the technicalities at the minimum. But uh, mainly the discussions will be a bit philosophical. So I will be questioning why we are doing quite a lot. Yeah. So let's go there and uh, why? Yeah, keeper, I guess. Ah, that is the one. I have two. Very good. Perfect. So uh, this is a co-authored um, project paper, however you say. We plan to work in this kind of issues quite a lot. So I can call it a project, and it's one paper from that kind of project. So um, what I do, and as well as my co-authors, uh, Inaki Parmener, who by training is a demographer, as well as mathematician, and Gaston Yelonesky is my uh, colleague at uh, the same department. So our offices next to each other, just that he doesn't come to the office so often he lives in London. Um, so mainly what we do, uh, we work quite a lot um, developing different methods and applications for non-monetary values. Because economists typically, they are interested in monetary indicators and the uh, tools for monetary measurement, whether it's poverty, inequality, well-being, standards, or whatever you call it, but well developed. Less attention has been provided to non-monetary indicators, and typically is the monetary measurement tools, they are just imposed, if I can use the word, on non-monetary measurement without understanding the consequences. So one part of my research, as well as Gaston, is to develop uh, or enhance the technicalities for the non-monetary measurement, because different variables come in. Gaston, for example, here is working on employment using um, the ordinal data, where you just uh, uh, you know, uh, choose to convert, or sometimes because of no choice, you have only binary indicators. How to implicate them? Can you just simply blindly use monetary tools to measure those things? Probably not. Yeah. 
So idea for this particular paper is to look at the bounded variables. I will talk about what bounded variables, what we mean by bounded variables. And you will see probably practically it makes sense to you know, consider you know, the technical side of this kind of variables, yeah? Um, so I would not probably have to, this is inequality, uh, uh, International Inequality Institute seminar series, so I do not have to explain to you why we are concerned about inequality. Okay, the debate for inequality, this is what we are doing in the Institute. Um, so of course, um, there have been discussions about income inequality, but of course there are uh, interest in non-monetary inequality as well, SDG 10, for example. Uh, uh, talks about reducing inequality within countries. And definitely it has moved beyond monetary indicators, could be indicators of health. I presented at one of the health institute at Oxford, that's why I kept it in blue, but here it doesn't matter, they, they see it all black. Um, indicators of health, education, access to service. Uh, these are the indicators you just cannot assume they can go on and on and on. There's a point beyond which they cannot Go. Yeah. Um, in general, these non pecuniary indicators, they're bounded in that sense, they take values from a closed interval, we say, in the technical one, but you can think of there is an upper bound, there is a lower bound. Uh, let's think of literacy rate. We are interested in understanding convergence or inequality in literacy rates across countries. Well, the minimum can be 0%, maximum can be 100%, right? So unlike income, the upper bound cannot just go. It is just, you have a strict bound, zero here, 100 years, and that's all, yeah? We are going to refer to those as bounded variable. That means indicators, which has a lower bound and an upper bound, that only really cannot grow. Now you may ask questions, well, you know, what do you think about life expectancy? They have a fuzzy upper bound and so on. Definitely, we cannot expect life expectancy rate of a country in the next 20 years to be 150. Definitely, it is not possible. But it could vary between 80 to 85. We are not going that far yet. That requires further development of that upper bound. But we are just assuming here that support bounds are fixed. What happens? How do you measure it? What? Now, let me try to show you what is the fundamental difference between bounded variable and non-bounded variable um, when we are trying to assess inequality. Now, if we look, forget about for a moment, for a moment, forget about whether the variable is bounded or unbounded, you are trying to understand, oh, what should be the most egalitarian situation, technically? Well, you say, you know what, whether it's monetary or non-monetary, the most egalitarian situation would be where everybody, so suppose all of us here, we are, uh, you know, we are the distribution. So we are elements, different elements in the distribution. All of us have the same achievement, then it's the most important way. There's not much doubt about it, right? If we, all of us have same income, if all of us have same level of education, we have same access to resources, that's the most egalitarian distribution, technically, yeah? What happens when you try to define what would be the most unequal distribution? Now, if we have income, if we have thousand pounds to share between us, probably the most unequal distribution would be having one have as 1,000 pound, the rest of us having nothing. So you think about, well, if that is to, that has to be the case, this is how it should be. One person has everything, others have nothing. That's the maximum inequality you can have when you have income, okay? So if we have a non-bounded variable or a monetary indicators, all elements barring one are equal to the lower bound. This is another alternative way of saying it. So if we have two pounds to distribute, then Four people, among five people, four people should not have anything, one person should have everything. If the total income increases from two to three, well, one person should have three, rest. Who has that three doesn't matter. As long as one person has three, rest have nothing, that is the maximum inequality you can have in a monetary world, okay? And 
This MID is a generally ranked by different indices, the Gini, the Gini index or any related mean quality index. It would rank, it would assign the same value whether you assess inequality here or here. Okay, they are equally unequal they are, because they are the most unequal distribution. Now, for the bounded variable, suppose now I say, you know what? The maximum one can have is one. The minimum can be zero, but maximum you can have is one, say 0% and 100%, fraction between zero. So if I save that particular limit, what would be the most unequal distribution corresponding to this one and this one? So if I have zero, 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 four zeros and two, if that is, if the total distribution, total amount is two, I give one person one, the other person one, and race don't have anything. That is the maximum unequal distribution because you cannot go beyond that. If you exhaust all the resources, the maximum inequality you can have is zero, 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 one, one. If you have a total value of three, then the maximum inequality distribution would be zero, zero, one, 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 right? So you can see in unbounded case, yes, we can give the entire thing to one person, nothing to the rest. Doesn't quite work when you have a bound, upper bound. The question is here, here we rank the most unequal distributions equally. What should be done here? Because if you try to rank them, assuming their bound could be shifted, you can come up with some ideas where it would be more unequal or less unequal. And I will talk about it, what the literature says. Over the 30 years, people have tried to rank these things. But what should we do here when naturally we have a bound? We cannot move beyond. Okay. So what we do in this paper, and I will try to do in this presentation as well, justify a new principle called a maximality principle, and we will try to motivate from uh, philosophy literature. Yeah? We present, again, this is the, this will be the technical part, but I will try to explain. Not many slides, only three slides. Yeah? We, will, we will just interview the inequality measures. And then we talk about something called consistency, um, which has been sort of worked on quite a lot in the literature. It's not something we need to be doing. What is the idea? Is that suppose you have a variable, so as I said, you have literacy rates across countries, so it can lie between zero and 100%. Now, instead of literacy rate, you may say, hmm, I want to represent them in terms of illiteracy rate so that country governments will understand better. Fine, people have different ways of saying things. You may either try to see from attainment or illiteracy, which is called a shortfall. The question is, should that transformation change your judgment of inequality? Probably it should not. The consistency required, whether you access it in terms of the actual achievements or their shortfalls. So literacy or illiteracy should not change. I will show you how traditional inequality measures actually do not evaluate consistently. Okay. Now this has been studied, this is not something new. What we will do, we will just show what changes we may need to do in our indices so that it also satisfies additionally consistency. I'll come to that. And then I'll show an illustration and to show that how these uh, normalized <coughs> measures that we define, how they can show, uh, uh, they can sort of present a different, and narrate a different picture. That's the idea. Okay. So let's look at some of these, these numbers. Yeah? Now, our approach, not exactly our approach, but spirit, in spirit, it's very similar to some work that people have done over the last 30 years. So what people do, if, if you may have heard about uh, Levy's dual sector model and so on, Kuzmet's idea. So the idea is that suppose in your country, you have a rural sector and urban sector, or a poorer sector than a richer sector, yeah? So the idea is if you move slowly, the inequality literature in general assumes we have a given level of a fixed level of income. And if you redistribute, how inequality will change. So if you have a uh, 100 pound and you distribute between two people, you have zero and 100, but you redistribute, say, 70 and 30, of course, it's more equal. This is the idea. 
Question is, what happens when this average changes? How do we compare inequality? Because when the average is fixed or the total amount is fixed, redistribution reduces inequality. Fine. But when the average itself is changing because of growth, how the inequality framework should be adjusted? Okay. So this following set of papers, this is what they try to do. They call it sectoral shift or population shift, population shifting from poor sector to the rich sector and so on. So let's look at the example. So if we look at say distribution A, it has five people, four people have one, 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 the one pound, one pound, one pound, one pound, it's the non-monetary world, uh, monetary world. And the fifth person has a value of five. So definitely it is not a perfectly equal distribution. There's some inequality. Now suppose what happens when you move from A to B, this one poor person moves from the poor sector to the rich sector. So now you have a value of one, 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 five, five. Then again, gradually move to distribution B, where another poor person moves to the richer sector. You have one, one, five, five, five. And then finally you have one poor person and then you have four people in the rich sector. So the population, total population size I have for, you know, for simplicity kept unchanged, but this is how the distribution has changed. Now, given that I have 40 minutes to spare, not just I have to finish in 15 minutes, how would you rank these distributions? Anyone, which distribution you would consider as more unequal, which distribution you would consider as less unequal? Among these four, A, B, C. E is better. No. Ooh. Which one? B is better. B is better. Okay. We have one verdict. Anyone else? No one. I mean, I'm not going to give you a particular answer. There is a particular answer. So that's why I'm trying to understand your judgment. Would all of you say B is the most equal distribution? No. There you go. So you have something else in mind. This is exactly what I wanted to understand. So there is disagreement in the society. You see, that's where the normative principle comes into play. So we cannot just do positive measurement here. Just say, oh, this is more, this is less. Let's see what the literature has talked about it from philosophy as well as measurement. Yep. So Temkin in 1986 talked about five different possibilities here. Okay. Possibility one, an increase in inequality throughout as you move from A to B. And what is the argument? As you keep on moving, as the poorer are moving to the richer sector, and you are leaving some poor behind, the argument would be you are isolating the poor. So this one could be the most unequal because one person has been left behind. Everybody has moved on. So from that ethical point of view, you could argue this is the most unequal distribution. Okay. Second one. A decrease in inequality throughout because it's a gradual elitism of the rich. So richer are moving to, poorer are moving to richer. So richer are becoming more homogeneous group and so on. So you are make, uh, pushing people from poor to rich. Fine, in a sense, you are improving the society. So as you are saying, could be gradually, you know, less unequal. Then comes Kuznet, who says, you know what? You are moving people, so agricultural sector and urban sector. If everybody is in the, most of the population is in urban sector, they are feeling more homogeneous among each other. So here you are trying to understand the tension between within group inequality and between group inequality. Okay, so he would go with uh, initially increase, maximum and then decrease here, because most of the people have this more homogeneous people in the richer sector. Then there is argument by Gary Phils you know what, this whether inequality will go up or down should be the interaction between these two. And what he's trying to present, trying to argue that, you know what, initially there is a decrease because elitism of the rich dominates. But as you move along in the final distribution, look, isolation of the poor is so much that this is dominating the game. So you can see we already have four possibilities over here. Yeah. And there's a final possibility, and I will come back to this later, inequality remains unchanged throughout because we just simply cannot rank them. So you can see there are five. So as I said, so there is no particular one way of viewing the problem. 
Now, I will try, I don't know whether I will be, but I will try to convince you of choosing a particular possibility of this file in our context. I hope it is quite non-technical so far. Yeah? Okay. Thank you so much. So, Tenkin and Bosman's, Bosman's is a technical paper, and it shows that under some mathematical assumptions that we do most of the time, if we do that, then one, two, and three are three possibilities that, is, that are acceptable. He discards, he shows fourth possibility is not feasible. Whereas Phil's, in a, in a sequence of papers, have tried to argue it could be one, two, or four. He went against the Simon Kuzmin's argument. He's trying to see in terms of the introduction of these two, but then Bosman shows that mathematically, under these mathematical assumptions that we did, is very much like Arrow's impossibility theorem. So if you have these kind of assumptions, the fourth possibility is excluded. I'm not going again to these technical assumptions at this point. Yeah. However, there is no mention of the fifth one. Okay, because no one says it should remain unchanged. Mind though, here we are talking about income. So these five could become six and seven gradually over time. And that comes our next slide. Let's look at these three distributions now, A, B, and E. Now, A, now if I ask you again, if you have to compare A and E, which one do you consider as more unequal between A and E? A is more unequal or more equal? A is more equal. A is more equal, E is more. Any disagreement here? Hopefully not. Between B and E, which one would be more equal? You go with B? Okay. So what we'll do, and based on the properties and as well as societal judgment, we will probably say distribution E is more unequal than distribution A and B. Because distribution E cannot be any worse. This is the maximum possible inequality here, right? Now, for a bounded variable with lower bound of one, say an upper bound of five, distribution E is not feasible. So in the income world, we have this distribution and we are saying which one is more, which one is less. But that particular possibility E is completely out of question when we have an upper bound of five. The question is, how do we compare A and B in this situation? Okay. So what we try to, so of course, A and B, they are both maximum inequality distribution because you cannot make it any worse. They are maximum inequality given the bound of one and five. Okay. So our maximality principle says, and we will say why we are doing this, for a bounded variable with a given lower bound and an upper bound, whenever we pick any two maximum inequality distributions, because corresponding to their situation, they are the maximally unequal, we are saying inequality levels should be the same because they are the worst in their situation. So here is a supporting argument from Temkin when Temkin was trying to justify why flows distribution should be considered equally unequal. He said, you know, two judges who accept bribes in all their cases might be equally corrupt, even if one tried fewer cases than the other. Okay, so that's sort of our argument. So of the list of five, we are going for the fifth one in the bounded variable setting. That's our idea. Yeah, but then the mathematics comes. So I, when I teach to my master's students, I always try to tell them, you know what? It's not that you select a measure and then you try to do a robustness check. This is what I've done. First, decide what you want. Then you select your measure. Because depending on what you want, your measure should be selected, not the other way around. And even if you do robustness test, if I do not agree with your philosophy behind it, I don't care what robustness test you do. They're all wrong. So in bounded variable case, suppose you use Gini, and then you try to do robustness check with Atkinson's generalized entropy and whatever else. My idea is that you are dead wrong because not all of them are relatively inequality measures, which will give you wrong results anyway. So robustness test doesn't matter, okay? Great. So 
few slides of mathematics, but please, please don't worry. I so in general, we are saying that x equal to b, that means suppose n is the number of people over here. So we are summarizing everybody's achievement, everybody's education or health or whatever. Yeah, the average is given by the uh, thing mu and forget about them at this moment. And suppose we have a lower bound of zero, upper bound of u, and uh, an inequality index simply just takes all these values and summarizes the number. This is what we are trying to do because we do not want to leave the uh, the floor open. So, you know, in Amartya Sen's um, idea, when he's doing inequality, he sometimes wants to leave the option open that some distributions cannot be compared. It's called an incomplete ranking. So you get two distributions, but he always keeps the possibility open that okay, some distributions we can just say they are not comparable. So we say comparison or ranking is incomplete. We are not allowing that. By assuming this last one, we are saying inequality is complete. But anyhow, we have to rank two distributions, the final number. That's the idea here. Yeah. Now, this one looks messy, but this particular one has a message and I want to sort of convey to you. Technically, if we start with the distribution and we try to make it as unequal as possible, we could end up in two types of scenarios in bounded variable case. One scenario, which will nicely give us distribute or divide the entire population into some of them having the lower bound, some of them having the upper bound. We call this bipolar distribution because we have two poles. Some people have nothing or the lower bound and some people have the upper bound. But then you can also end up another kind of distribution where you have, say, some people having zero. And suppose if U is one, some people having one, but then one person will have something between zero and one. So these are technically, if you make a distribution maximally unequal, we were only talking about them, but there is also another possibility. What it will do, it will just, we have to adjust our measures accordingly. Okay. It's creates a little bit of nuance, but anyways. So um, again, verbally, what this means, in general, these are typical um, for properties or axioms when you are creating an inequality measure. So the first thing we assume, anonymity. So it's only the distribution of what we have, in, it matters. It doesn't matter who has that particularly. So if we exchange our status, it should not make any difference to the inequality measurement, fine? And the transfer, the P. Dalton transfer principle, the main idea, if we have a distribution, if you are taking from the poor, giving to the rich, it's regressive, inequality increasing. If you are taking certain things from the uh, rich to the poor, it's progressive, inequality reducing. Now you could say, hmm, how are you going to take somebody's education and give it to another person? How are you going to take? So it is not necessarily that they have to be physically transferable. But if the two distributions are such that one is can be obtained from the other, they are comparable. That's it. So we are not saying they are physically transferable. But suppose you have one society where somebody has zero education, somebody has 10 years of education, versus you have a society where both have five, five. Of course, the society, the latter society, P is more equal than the other one. That's what you mean by this idea. Yeah. And then the other two, of course, equality principle says that if everybody has the same achievement, there should be no inequality and you should have a value of zero, which is a typical assumption made in any inequality measurement. The population principle, the idea is that suppose we have us here. Now suppose we, I create a clone of each of us so that the population of these particular room doubles, but with the same distribution. Population principle says, you know what, that should not matter. We should not have any change in inequality because of that. Yeah, these are simple properties. Uh, so applications, loading, I do not know what. This look again messy, but let me just tell you the non-technical version of it. So given everything, when we characterize, if they satisfy this property, an inequality index satisfies this anonymity. That means our uh, uh, it's our identity doesn't matter. Transfer principle, equality principle, and the one that we have added, maximum inequality principle. 
it turns out how the inequality measure looks like. They have a proportionally constant, which is say n, the multiplication of something which lies between zero and infinity. And then the inequality index itself is a normalized version. Now, this is the maximum possible inequality for a particular distribution. This is the minimum possible inequality. And this is the actual level of inequality. So you compute the actual. So if you use Gini coefficient, this is the Gini coefficient minus the zero because minimum Gini is going to be zero. If you, this is the maximum Gini for the distribution minus zero. So this is just a normalized version of an inequality measure. That is what mathematically it is telling us. Okay. Now, one thing I would like you to notice that the min maximum inequality distribution, given that this is for fixed population, we can have two different kinds of situations. Either the maximum inequality distribution would be bipolar or it would be almost bipolar. So of course, the functional form of this one will change. If we assume variable population, the population principle, then the maximum inequality distribution, I'm not going to too much technicalities, but it always become bipolar. And in the next slide, it will be clear why we may want this one, okay, okay. With, with this assumption of population variance. So this is an example of how Gini coefficient looks like when we have normalized Gini. So G is the Gini coefficient, then the normalized Gini coefficient is equal to that Gini coefficient times, this is the absolute Gini coefficient times the upper bound divided by the mean times the upper bound minus mean. So this is the adjustment we need to make so that they are useful for bounded variables and satisfy the principle called maximality principle. Otherwise, they buy it. Okay, enough theory. Uh, let's move on. There's an illustration. We will come to that illustration very soon. But just to quickly show you this consistency requirement, which requires that many bounded variables, they are either mortality or the survival, so literacy or illiteracy, you have to choose between the two, but there is no particular judge and why one should be chosen than the other. There is no a priori reason. Now, how to ensure that inequality assessment is consistent uh, when we switch between this attainment and shortfall? And there's a long list of literature who have um, uh, worked on this thing. And here's an example for you. So the left-hand side, we are comparing cross-country inequality um, uh, in uh, the BCG immunization rate, where uh, we are doing in terms of attainment. So here you have immunization rate, more is better, right? If you compare them if between 1985 and 2005, you can clearly see inequality has gone down. These are using Lorentz curves, by the way. Yeah. So if the Lord, this is the line of perfect equality, when you have perfectly equal distribution, this is how it looks like. And closer you move to that perfect equality line, that means your inequality is going down. If you compare cross-country inequality in 1995 and 2005, clearly inequality has gone down. Now somebody says, hmm, instead of looking at immunization rate, we may want to see non-immunization rates. Yeah. If you just compute non-immunization rate, do you have the inequality comparison set? It actually reverses. So think about it. I am saying, no, I'm just assessing inequality across immunization rate. And Karsten says, you know, Shuman, I like the non-immunization rate because I want to look at it from a deprivation point of view. If I claim inequality has gone down, Karsten will always claim inequality has gone up. This is what happens when we use the wrong tool for our purpose. None of you will probably claim this should be acceptable. But Gini indices have been used. Gini index will also agree. Gini index for these uh, immunization rate will say Gini index has gone down. Gini index for non-immunization rate will say it has gone up. Always. Probably it's not acceptable. Right? That's why we need to move on from this. Okay, great. So in general, I'm not going too far into this one. I just want to go to the examples because we have lack of time. So what we do here, just to show you how inequality has changed over time, 
we started the evolution of cross-country inequality in two health indicators. And I will show you an education indicator um, as well. Um, so we have under five survival rate, infant survival rate, then um, attainment, complements of the mortality rate, and we use some education indicators as well. And we use three different inequality indicators. We use the absolute Gini index, the relative Gini index, and normalized Gini index. Just to show you how things change. Okay. I have to click something. So this is how the mortality rate, under five and infant mortality rate, how the average across countries, the simple average across countries. This is how they have improved over time. Since 1950 to 2015, this is how they improved. So it looks like the average has improved over time, which is a good thing. Before I move, I want to show you some simulation results. Here in the simulation results, what we have done, we have as the average has improved, because remember for inequality assessment, people generally keep the average constant and then show how inequality is changing. Here, what we have plotted, the inequality was supposed to be increasing from zero, sorry, sorry, mean was improving from zero to one. Okay. This is just a simulation. So we took the maximum inequality, possible inequality with an upper bound of one, lower bound of zero. And we try to simulate how different inequality measures perform. Absolute Gini index is an U-shaped curve naturally. So if you take a particular, um, uh, if you take a particular value between zero and one and look at its average, generally you will see this tendency. You will see initially up until a mean of half, inequality will go up, then inequality will fall. But that does not necessarily mean inequality has gone up or fall, fallen, because this is a mechanical relationship you see for relative inequality measures. Sorry, absolute inequality measures. Gini index, when we take, it is continuously falling. So it doesn't matter what happens in the distribution. As the average increases, and you, you look at the inequality in the maximum inequality distributions, it will always fall. So if you use Gini, it will always tell you there has been convergence, nothing to worry. There has been convergence, nothing to worry. Okay. Now we go back and try to show you these are simulated results. We go back. So this is so here you can see the average is continuously increasing, right? We have restricted to be between zero and one. So we expect the absolute measures to go like this. Up. Sorry, this is the yeah, so sorry, my fault. Uh, it's average was increasing. Uh, this is the absolute of the relative. I think it is the yeah. Sorry, let me go back once more. I just do not want to confuse what we find. So this is the absolute right. So the average lies to the if the average is to the right of 0.5, absolute will always go down. Okay. Look what happens here. The starting is above 0.5 anyway. So given that the average started at 0.5, we would expect the absolute to always go down. And look, this is exactly what we find. Absolute is always going down. Now, when we have the relative, relative, no matter what which side the average is, relative will always go down. And this is what we get for relative. This is also always going down. Now, when we normalize, this is the picture we get. So when we say, you know, the existing level of inequality, what about it is normalized or relative to the maximum possible inequality? Where does it stand? We get a completely different picture. It's actually increasing and stabilizing after some point. So you can see the empirical value added here. Then we present the we present the education indicator. Uh, we look at uh, cross country inequality in primary education rate, secondary education rate, and tertiary education rate. What we observe. So here, a nice story. So for the primary, it starts above 0.5. So you know what to expect. It will always go down. This one, secondary, is starting below 0.5, ending up above 0.5. Uh, 0.5. You know what to expect for relative always fall and for absolute was net and then finally tertiary always remain below 0.5 
we also know what will happen. Absolute will go up, relative will fall. So here is what we observe. There you go. So if you use these absolute measures, we know what is, it's a predictable way of saying. So inequality is just predicted beforehand. This is how you will observe. But that does not mean it's following a real Kuznet or not. We do not know. So this is just mathematical and structural fallacies within the indices, unless we choose them properly. Again, again, relating will always fall as we predicted. There you go. This is the normalized one. So if you look at inequality compared to their maximum level at that point of time, yeah, this one is stable. These two, they're increasing. Okay, so you can see clearly, empirically, it makes a difference how we see that for the boundary variable. Okay, so I hope I'm within time. So again, concluding, not much to say. I, I think I have just said mostly. So uh, a key difference definitely between these bounded and unbounded setting is how you interpret maximum inequality and how you compare them across distribution. And our whole objective for the paper, although we just say, we probably should have added uh, uh, two words in the title for varying, changing average or something like that. Because this is what we are trying to do in this paper. We are trying to compare inequality to assess inequality when the average is changing. We're not keeping the average fixed as people do in general. There could be misleading conclusions unless we adapt our measurement to this particular setting. Um, so for the Kuznet one, as you saw, if you use absolute inequality measures, which people suggest for bounded variable for consistency as well, you will see a mechanical way of looking at it. That inequality will increase and then go down to the mechanical way of doing it. Now, if we normalize and look then relative to the maximum inequality for each, probably we'll get a better picture. We can take away this mechanical part, this kind of controlling for the mechanical part, and then looking at whether you really want. So um, the researchers in Cornell, uh, Chris Barrett and his team, they tried to implement this uh, approach and try to understand whether we really see a food security Kuznet curve, where they estimate the probabilities of being food, food spoons food security poor or something, and they try to see whether there is a Kuznet curve over time. When they use absolute, they see, but the Kuznet curve holds even after they control for the maximum possible inequality for its distribution. Even then, so the paper was published in World Development in 2021 or 2022. Oh, 2023, sorry. Uh, it's written there. So of course, future research, as we said, that we assume that the upper bound is strict, so we cannot do say inequality comparisons here in our framework for life expectancy. We have to make some assumptions that it cannot go beyond 90 or something like that. But eventually, who knows, improving biotechnology pushes the average life expectancy beyond 90, beyond 100. So in that case, the upper bound is not completely fixed. It can change slightly over time. Uh, maybe it may require a little bit of adjustment you know, to get a completely uh, technical picture. Then of course, uh, people use dominance. So you want to know irrespective of all parameters when one distribution has more inequality, just like Lawrence, we have not done that. So that's something probably is future kind of work that, that we want to do. There you go. I finished here. Okay. Question from here, yeah, absolutely. Hi. Hi, thanks for the presentation. I was, I was almost not sure about coming and this was maybe the most insightful presentation I have attended from the from the Inequalities Institute. Uh, okay, good. Um, I was wondering, first of all, how does this does this disprove uh, PKT? In what sense? In the sense that you say, you say if you apply this to the food security, for example, you find you're proving the Kuznets curve, but PKT goes beyond the Kuznets curve, right? Are you talking about in income world? Because depending yeah, on the PKT income, is doing yeah. well, right? PKT yeah. is mainly doing well. Exactly. Now, wealth is unbounded. Okay. Wealth is going beyond bound. Right? So it's anyway, okay. So it's so anyway. You can use the typical measurement tools, and if he finds, if his findings suggest that he's going beyond, that's fine. Objective of this particular paper is that we should not use the monetary tools blindly to non-monetary index. So in the 
the paper I was in my last slide, uh, uh, President, was the published in World Development. They should not use just Lawrence curve or because if they do, they will get a wrong conclusion anyway. Because I showed you there is a mechanical part of relative absolute inequality measures anyway, right? So for they probably it is good also to see how the inequality is changing compared to the maximum imaginable inequality, which is very different in bounded variable situations than non bounded. Does it make sense? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Hi. Um, <clears throat> so, when wondering about the normative um, motivation to do all this, I thought to myself, isn't there an obvious extension of what you're doing here in terms of not looking at pure inequality, but if I think about the kind of variables you're interested in, many of them might be, I don't know, SDG indicators, these kind of things. Um, I, I would have thought perhaps it's more relevant, and maybe you're already doing that, to look at normative welfare or distribution sensitive welfare measures rather than a pure inequality measure, as it were, yeah. to account for both the increase in average and the dispersion at the same time. So when you say distribution sensitive measure, how are the sensitive distribution? What kind of idea you have in mind? So if you have an Atkinson style measure or something, mm -hmm. and you would try to extend what you're doing here for bounded variables to that in order to, I guess the moral um, problematic is that if you only look at inequality without also acknowledging that in general, the absolute situation of many people, for example, is improving. Absolutely. And I would say maybe more fives than ones is actually better. So if I have that kind of stance, I might- you know, Lord, you are, What you are talking about, uh, the difference between Lorentz curve, comparison across Lorentz curve versus comparison across generalized Lorentz curve. Yes. You are looking at the value. Now, let's take the example of, you could take Atkinson, you could take Gini, both are same. Now Atkinson, you can write Atkinson as average times one minus the well-being of that from Atkinson world would be average, say income average, times one minus an Atkinson's measure. Right? This is how you do it. For Gini as well, it's called G, the welfare version of Gini is called same mean. What is same mean? You have the average income times one minus Gini. You are discounting for the existing Gini and you're multiplying with the, so you are looking at this kind of leaky bucket theory. You have the leaky bucket, you put water in it and you are taking from one place to the other, some water is leaking. That leaked water is inequality. That's the idea, concept. So you take mean and you do one minus discounting for G. Now look at what you're doing. So your answer, your question has two parts. One is, should we do anything like that? First of all, the Atkinson and G, they are relative. So you have to be very careful in that world because you are bringing the concept of relativity over here, and relativity doesn't work. Relative inequality index doesn't work conceptually. Number one. Number two, that anyway, can we do something like this? Possible. You could. We have to think about it. We haven't thought about it. But possibly it could. You have the average, but I think the idea would be the same. You have the average, you discount for one minus the inequality. So you will again, the average, how much you are losing because of the existing inequality. Do you see why I was a bit, why I need to explain that a bit more? Atkinson was my example. I mean, you could exactly. I got that. I got that. That's why. So you probably were talking about the second more, but you you came up with the Atkinson. That's why I have to explain for the audience a bit more. Does that answer your question? Yeah. But it's possible. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But you haven't because you said this was one paper among many, so you haven't. That's not one of the other papers. We we wanted to directly compare. Say when you do conversions, you do not talk about the average there. You just say whether everybody is on the same boat or not. I do not care how big the boat is. You are just saying whether say, everybody is in the same boat. You can see two different ways, but I would think that is important too. You see, rather than looking at the size, but size probably could be incorporated in the same way. But given that we work in the axiomatic world, I am not just going to give you some particular rough ideas because unless you prove this true mathematically. I'm not going to say how this is feasible. I cannot do that. We haven't made that try yet. You okay? Any other questions in the room? Are there any online? Okay. All right. Translate this public policy. You're talking to the government. What are the implications? Yeah. 
First of all, if the government, let's say government of UK, they always talk about uh, sort of uh, leveling, mm -hmm. leveling up, right? So that is the idea of leveling up. Suppose you do at, at the smaller geographic level. You want to say that over time, whether all these, so your performance, it, suppose first think of in terms of per capita income. When you're doing leveling up, that is one way of doing it. And especially when we have a right-wing government, of course, they will think only about income, growth and income, right? So if you have to do leveling up, what you're interested in is cross-regional inequality. Now, if you're only interested in income, you can just use your Gini coefficient or whatever to be able to say whether regional inequality, whether there's been regional convergence or not. Fine? Now, suppose instead of income, you have a more holistic view. Right? You are doing your multidimensional deprivations or whatever across with you. You want to see that whether this poverty reduction has been higher for the poor or so. Suppose you have this aggregate figure for these regions. And you want to see that over time, this inequality in headcount ratios or poverty index has gone down or time or not. You cannot use Gini, I guess, because you know some of the mechanical pictures you will be getting. If the average is above 0.5, you will always see absolute reduction in Gini and relative will always show. There probably you need something else. It works, by the way, Ophi's work and your work as well. Ophi has not tried, and I have also purposely not tried. Sabina Alta and Mariama, they were working on a paper where they were trying to understand. So you have, so in your counting approach, you have between zero and one, the counting score. Right? This is how it wants. So suppose you have 10 indicators, you sum up your deprivations. If you have no deprivations at all, you get a score of zero. And suppose you have deprivations, all indicators, you select the weight such a way that the highest value is one. So the deprivation score lie between zero and one. Now for the sample distribution that you have got, you get a score of zero and one. Now, Ophi has tried as well, Ophi is still trying, and I'm working with Sabina in another paper where we are, we are saying how to compute exactly in your line, Jacob, the distribution sensitive change or whatever. Suppose you are saying, you know what? Is the inequality among these deprivations, where has it gone down or up? And there's a paper by Sabina Ankar and Maria Emma Santos. They are trying. So I am Sabina in 2014. We didn't know about this paper. We didn't think about it at the point. 2014, we published a paper. And we said, it came out in 2017, but anyway, so the idea is that if you have to measure, you have to measure inequality, if you have to measure inequality in, in this kind of situation where you have deprivation score, you should use absolute inequality measures. Why? The idea is that, just to show you here, just again, in the policy world, okay? So that it may help. So the idea is that, Whatever you have, if you want to have consistency, because deprivation score, you can have either deprivation score or attainment score. They are the two sides of the coin. And ideally, you, do, you want to maintain consistency. That means inequality. Then you should just use absolute inequality index. This is the paper. OK? So we had that approach. James Foster has always thought, hmm, FGT is his child, right? And FGT can be broken down into mean into uh, average deprivation score and generalized entropy of order two, which is coefficient of variation. So he always tries to break his measure into these three components. And you may use, you may choose to do coefficient of variation. I'm sorry, I will come up and say that they're wrong. Because a coefficient of variation will always tell you it is going to go down. Nicole Griffin, another name, who did multidimensional measure, and he adopted this FGT2 in uh, counting across framework. And this is exactly what she reported. And she had this particular downward. So whenever you have high, higher attainments, higher MPI, inequality will always, it will show inequality is always going down. Okay? Given that, your MPI deprivation score is bounded between zero and one. I would argue, probably this convincing to many other people who have not applied. I would argue normalized indices are the way to look at it. So even if you look at employment, rate changing, cross country convergence or convergence across, I would suggest using this inequality measure because otherwise you know how much 
what is the likelihood for you to get this mechanical change? Hey, can we do that paper? <laughs> so that's all the policy implications. Does it make sense? Yeah. My question is more about the nature of the bounded variables because there are many types of bounded yes. variables, and mainly we have been talking about zero and one variables when we got to measurement or to the applications or the illustrations. Mm -hmm. um, but for example, at some point you said if, if we're talking about literacy rates, and we cannot have at some point 150% literacy rate, right? It's 100%. But you can have an idea of a good or a, or a service, access to a service, or more, yeah. mainly goods, where you increase the production, but that same amount goes to the same person, and that still represents 100% of the of the amount of the good for one person, right? So you were saying amount. You were looking at the quantity. Yeah, yeah. No, but if you measure it, then as the percentage of what you okay. You're still having that this person has a one, the hundred percent, and everybody has zero. But this person in reality has two goods. So I'm I'm guessing this kind of measure do not take that into account. That comes a bit with a kind of distributional. Slightly. Stuff. You have to you have to look at your variable a bit more carefully. You said this is the production of good, the total production of good, but it is possible that one person get everything. You are still in the world of cake dividing problem. Cake dividing problem is distributed income because the cake can be continuously divided, although it's a total cake. So the example we give in our paper, we start with the cake dividing problem because this is what people get. You know? So suppose this is what we do. Suppose that cake division does not have any restriction. One person can get 100%, other gets none. You are in the typical world of cake dividing problem, money dividing problem, where one person can get everything. No, 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 let me finish. Let me finish. Let me finish. But suppose I impose a restriction. You know what? This is unhealthy. No one person can get more than half of the cake. <laughs> you have to divide the cake between five people. But I have this additional restriction. The so maximum that one person should get is 50 percent. Otherwise, it's unhealthy. I impose that rule. So the maximum inequality distribution in case will be. Two person getting half and half, rest of it. Perfectly in the world where, where we belong. So again, that sort of thing, how you define the rule. If it's a cake cutting problem where one person can give everything, it's very similar to the monetary world. You do not come to our bounded approach here because the bound is, look how we have defined it. And this is important by the way. It's a good question. It's a very good question. But this is, look how we have defined it, the thing here. So, this is the definition of our bounded indicator situation. Take values from a closed interval with fixed limit and where is the other one? Sorry, I have to find you the exact definition. Okay. Fixed or bound, lower bound. Right. All elements parting one are equal to the lower bound. This is the situation, this is your cake dividing problem. So barring one, everybody is getting, so you will, so whatever the size of the production in your life, in your example, whether it is 100 kilogram, 200 kilogram, 300 kilogram, 400 kilogram, it doesn't matter. One person can always get everything. This is the word you were coming from, right? I was more thinking about the case of education because you were talking then about education and you see it as, as rate and for example, you have a bounded variable in education where you cannot have, let's say, but what, is the, what is the indicator of education you're talking about? That's important. Yeah, but choose an indicator first. My, 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 my question was more about when you go from, from one variable to the other, yes. because at the end, the rate of, of people getting high school yes. is the amount of people that get between this fixed amount of years, right? So you are basically mapping from the continuous to the rate from six to nine years of schooling to 30% getting high school. Yes, okay, so you are looking at yeah. the proportion of people getting high school, suppose. Yeah. And you are comparing across countries. But what you're not, not taking into account is, for example, that there are more people maybe getting 10 years instead of nine, which is an improvement in society. 
Look, I think where we are getting confused here, what I'm saying is that suppose you can come up with, you need to define the rule of the game first. That's very important. Once we define the rule of the game, I can tell you which measure to use. So what you are saying, probably you are you have a framework in mind which doesn't particularly fit here. Suppose take the example of years of schooling. So you have a distribution of years of schooling, and suppose I'm saying the maximum years of schooling is 18. Okay, with undergraduate and everything. So years of schooling can lie between 0 and 18. Here the lower bound is 0, upper bound is 18. And so you, it is fitting the boundary variable framework. But what you have in mind, you define the rule, maybe outside, I'm happy to talk to you or drop me an email, explaining clearly with a concrete example, and I will see whether it can fit that particular framework. But not every framework will fit here. That's not true. I'm not saying that it is universally applicable to all framework. I need to understand what exactly you have in mind. Then I 